This is Duke University. It was important that we were a circle because um, we had this idea of participatory teaching and learning from each other. And um, we always thought about having equal voice and ears in the process because in a circle everybody is the same distance from the center. One time someone said to me, why are your quilt so sad? <laughs> and I never thought they were sad, but I think what she was trying to say to me is that they, they touched on an emotion that I think sometimes we don't want to touch on. And whether that is uh, women's issues or lynching, I mean I've done a lot of quilts that deal with those kind of sensitive, sensitive topics that we need to address in quilting and just dealing with textiles is a wonderful way to kind of bridge that commonality, that human commonality, so that you can approach that sensitive subject in a warm way. These are our heirlooms. We didn't have sums of money or big houses or anything else to pass on to children. It was the very simple, simplistic things. And I think the African American quilt circle as a whole has brought the value of this handwork, the value of this history to the forefront so we know the importance that quilts have. So I'm going to start off with a very basic question that my cousin, who's known me all his life and my life, asked me. So uh, why do you ladies quilt? <laughs> you can buy a quilt. <laughs> but you can't buy one like we make. Okay. Um, I quilt because it relaxes me. It's something I thoroughly enjoy and I can express myself in a whole lot of different ways. It's an inexpensive art medium. <laughs> uh, you can use old clothes if you have nothing else. But I find that, it, as I say, it's relaxing, it's very creative for me, and it brings me peace. I quilt because it is um, a way for me to express my creativity. Um, it also validates my creativity. I love knowing that I have come up with something in my head and worked through it, problem solved, and then I have something. It's like magic to me. So it's very validating. Uh, it's endless possibilities. You can make it what you want. You can stay in, the, in your middle lane, or you can go all the way up there. It just really depends on what your personal interest is. It's very freeing. Um, anything goes, you can make it your own, and it brings me peace as well. And I quilt because I like to solve problems uh, as well. And uh, I quilt to make bed quilts. Uh, it's interesting for me because when I started quilting as a young girl, I quilted with my mother and the whole purpose was to make bed covers for the winter. So some of that uh, need to have bed covers still motivate me in my quilting, but I try in um, making the quilts to capture some of the um, elements of good bed making. Uh, for example, my big mama used to have these chenille um, bedspreads, mm -hmm. and they would always have a bouquet of flowers in the middle. So in my quilts, especially the early quilts that I made, I tried to uh, capture that, uh, that, that floral, that fancy, um, and the little ribbons and so forth. So, but I still quilt to make bed covers, and as I get on this journey, I uh, am finding myself expressing other ideas in my quilts. This is somewhat related to, and I think we know some of the answer from what you've said, but what do you think distinguishes quilting as a textile art from other textile arts like knitting or crocheting or, you know, 
And I know a lot of people, if you go through the, the publications of the Guild, you'll see that a lot of people do a lot of different textile arts and also visual arts, painting and whatnot. So. I selected quilting because I have done all the other kinds of needlework. I started out, you know, doing embroidery. From embroidery, I went to counted cross stitch. From counted cross stitch on to needlepoint. And then I decided, after I tried all those different ones, and of course, I used to make everything I wore back in the day. But everything there, you followed a pattern. You know, there was a set design. You had to make the sweater a certain size. And all of those things, to me, it was, I was programmed, OK? And some people can do it without, you know, create their own patterns, but I couldn't. And I found that quilting gave me uh, the greatest um, degree of creativity. It was manageable. It was inexpensive. I didn't need to buy fancy stuff. I could use old clothes. I could use what I had. And so, and the other thing about quilting now is that there are so many new materials, new techniques, new ideas, and things that were unthought of, you know, a long time ago. So that, to me, that's the difference between, you know, other needlework mm -hmm. and quilting. It's more expressive for me. I knit and I crochet and I embroider. Um, I think, well, for me, all of those textile arts, it gives me, I like to do things with my hands. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I don't know, in terms of the satisfaction of using my hands, I don't know if there's, a, if there's anything for me personally that distinguishes um, quilting from some of the other textile arts that I, uh, that I know. But one thing that's different with the quilting for me, you can, with all of the fabrics and the new techniques, you can express, I think, a broader range of themes and ideas. Um, I would like to just echo what my two um, quilt sisters said. Um, one thing for me was that um, I came from a background of doing a lot of other things as well. And I cruel, did cruel embroidery for like 10, 15 years, and I sewed clothes since I was a teenager, and one thing I think that kept, uh, that made quilting so attractive to me was it allowed me to merge my love of fabric and sewing. And I'm like, wow, okay, I don't have to make clothes all the time, you know. <laughs> I can still use, you know, that fabric to create something else. So that's why quilting basically became my love because I could still use my machine, still sew and honor that commitment that I made when I was in high school that sewing would always be an extension of my life. Mm -hmm. So quilting just became a part of that extension. Yeah, I feel like my journey's a lot like Marjorie's in that I, was, I did cruel and embroidery and my grandmother taught me a lot of those things and there was something about quilting that just stuck. And I think partly because I liked when I finished, and my mother uh, so, you know, has been sewing since she was 12, so I was always surrounded with fab by fabric. And I liked when I made the quilts, seeing the things from clothes I couldn't wear anymore or I'd outgrown, but the, the fabric kind of always spoke to like my mother's sewing history and our family history. And so there's something about that that really excites me. I also told, when my cousin asked me, I told him, well, I think quilters also like to buy a lot, you know, hoard fabric and, and create color and have color all around them, so. <laughs> Um, and so you've begun to tell us a little bit about your quilting journey, and I'm wondering if you guys could tell us a little bit more specifically how you learn to quilt and um, if you have a preferred technique. Um, well, I'll start. Uh, I learned to quilt from my grandmother and my mother. Uh, my grandmother grew up on a sharecropping farm in southwest Georgia, and she made quilts. Um, 
and she would sell the quilts for five, ten, fifteen dollars. That was a lot of money during the um, 1930s, 1920s. Um, and um, my mother was also a quilter, but, and it was really with my mother that I had, I mean, my mother was more directive. You know, this is how you do this. I watched my grandmother, and my grandmother was uh, a lot more creative than my mother. And they had that little rivalry going, you know, mother, mother-in-law, you know, daughter, mother-in-law kind of thing. And my mother really wanted to make quilts like my grandmother, but she never could do that. So I started, I was about seven years old, and I did the nine patch and four patch, and um, the uh, half square triangle. And uh, we would put quilts, you know, the patterns together based on those, uh, those designs. And then, um, I think it was like in the, well, I know in the 1970s, I used to sew for a um, African dress shop in Washington, DC. Oh. And I would um, go over every other day and pick up a stack of fabric and come home and I would make the dashiki for the man and make the dashiki for the sister and then the little baby dashiki. <laughs> you know, I did all of that. And so I had all of these scraps left over. And um, in 19, I remember this, in 1977, I was flipping through a McCall's pattern book and there was a quilt pattern. Now, I had not seen anything like that in a pattern book because we used to get patterns out of the newspaper or um, out of the almanac or something like that. So, and it was the Carolina Lily. And I thought that was the most beautiful pattern I had ever seen, you know, the diamonds and the little uh, stems and the leaves. So I decided I would take all of those scraps left over from those African garbs and garments I had made and do it in the Carolina Lily. And that I would use corduroy for the stem and um, use green, and I had dyed this golden rod yellow. Anyway, that's where, that's, so as a child and then, you know, McCall uh, pattern book, and that's how I got started again. But um, that, that's, that's pretty much my journey. Okay. I did not start quilting early on. My mother made utility quilts. She was always sewing something together to make a quilt to keep us warm. Her, her quilting was out of necessity. Um, and so I really didn't start until the 1980s, you know, my background, it just wasn't there where you would do these intricate patterns. But in 1980, I decided I can do that. Because I like geometry, I like, it wasn't my best subject in school, I'll tell you that. But it was, it was more of a challenge um, for me. And so I bought a book Let's make a patchwork quilt. And it had these different blocks. I still have it. I've kept it. It was put out in 1980. I'll never forget it. And I thought, I'm going to do this. I can do that. Because the formation, you know, of all of these quilts made it very intriguing and challenging for me. And so I started. And I never really took a formal class. I follow the book. I figure if you can read and if you can follow directions, you can do this. And so I made up in my mind that I was going to do it. And my first quilt was going to be a queen size bed quilt. <laughs> completely by hand. I made it. I won't tell you what decade I finished it in, but, but I, I did make it because for me, you know, that was the challenge. And I, I'm a new, 
Jersey native. And then I moved to upstate New York. Well, my goodness gracious, winters were endless. And so I worked on that quilt, but then I took a class. I made the first really small quilt I made. I had to do the pattern for it. I had to graft it. It was a mariner's compass with 32 points. And I finished it. Needless to say, those points were stitched on a sewing machine. But I did, I did finish it. So I guess I learned basic techniques and all of that by reading and doing. Uh, my quilting journey is very different from Marjorie's and Jerry Ann's. I never had quilts in my family. I, I'm from New Jersey as well. Um, I don't remember ever seeing a quilt. Now, maybe I did, but I never really saw a quilt, to my knowledge, until um, the day I walked into the first meeting for the African American Quilt Circle. So my journey started March 10th, 1988. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I was introduced to uh, the art of quilting. So I, uh, in terms of techniques, when I first started out, because I was new, it was just so exciting and oh, all of that. And I was very diligent about trying to make patterns and points match and whew, it was not a good experience for me. Uh, this was my first quilt. I thought it was appropriate to bring that here today. Uh, it's called Scrappy Beginnings, uh, and that's symbolic for the scraps that I used, as well as my own personal scrappy beginning in life. Uh, this was my first quilt, and I never made another quilt like this because I could not deal with matching and making sure everything was correct. Really so nice. I veered off from this point to this point. <laughs> so I do more narrative quilts now, and that's pretty much what my focus is. So that's my quilting journey with the African American Quilt Circle. So can you tell us a little bit about the other quilt as well? Uh, this Trayvon? quilt is, um, it's a quilt that I made uh, in honor of Trayvon Martin, and the quilt is called Stand For Me. Uh, there were so many emotions, as I'm sure a lot of us had, uh, when Trayvon met his untimely death. And so the quilt really is haphazard because I wanted to talk about and express every aspect I thought that was important about his untimely death. So it's Trayvon in the middle, the neighborhood watch, the state of Florida, the gun, the laws, the scales of justice. You know, just imagining him as a child. He was a child, 17 or not, he was still a child. His mother and father, he had mother and father who loved him. And just the possibilities of what he could have been. He loved airplanes, so I thought I would add that in the balloons that is symbolic for a lot of times when younger people die, especially they raise balloons. So that's Trayvon Martin's quilt stand for me. Beautiful, thank you. Do you want to tell us about this one? Uh, so I, uh, this quilt is called Flash of Spirit, uh, African Design Number Two. And one thing about the African American Quilt Circle, we always um, are inspired by what other quilters are doing. And um, a lot of our quilts, we use African prints. Um, I bet these are some left over from some of your sewing. Back in the 70s, yes. <laughs> so um, back in the 70s, I ran across a book of African designs. And I was doing uh, batik and uh, tie-dye. And I would batik, I would use those designs to do different um, shirts and uh, scarves. So this design, which is a kuba cloth, um, you know, that area of the Congo where they use the raffia to make the rugs, this quilt is based on that design. Now, part of the pleasure of doing this quilt was um, looking at the pattern in the book and figuring out how do I reproduce that in fabric. And um, 
So I figured it out, and it's rectangles and squares. And um, the movement, just like, I love the movement. And um, at first I tried to like capture the movement, and then I had to step back and say, no, where's the square, where's the rectangle? And then I found that. So I put it, I started just playing with it, I would never intended to finish it in this fabric, but I, <laughs> I kept going and going because I wanted to see the movement and ended up doing the whole thing. And uh, I think I have probably a good couple thousand French knots in there. I don't know if you can see those, but it's all hand done, hand pieced and hand quilted. Um, yeah, it's, it's one of my favorites. One other thing I wanted to say about your quilt, because um, Sauda brought up this issue of points, and um, there is a school of quilting that really values having, and I'll just get up, but having the, the different points match precisely. And so you'll see quilters come up and look really closely at your points. And so you, this one is a great example because it's got so many um, matching, um, you know, you can see they're literally points. But, so. Oh yeah, I mean the other thing. The, the other thing about that, I actually had the fussy cut the striped fabric because every piece is the same, <laughs> so that those stripes, when they come to the point, they actually match. So many of the quilts, particularly the story quilts, kind of take motifs, kind of isolate motifs in fabric and cut them out and kind of put them in a new setting so they stand out even more. And so it's called fussy cutting when you, you find the motif you want in there or you find the line the, that you think is the perfect line in the, in the fabric. So. My quilt is outside the door. And um, it tells a story, more or less. I do a lot of uh, story quilts. Applique is what I love the most. Mm -hmm. And so you will see a lot of applique pieces on, on that particular quilt. It's based on a book by uh, Michelle Alexander called The New Jim Crow. And it's really self-explanatory of three parts of African-American history. Um, so I think this is probably a question that will begin with Jerry Ann, but I asked the, the group to tell us a little bit about how the Guild got started. Okay, now this is when the story gets good. <laughs> not that they have not been good, but we love to talk about uh, how we got started. And um, we were here in Durham, and when I say we, Bertie Howard, is someone I had known from back in the movement days. Uh, she was working for Africa News and um, Candace um, Thomas. Thomas. At the time, it was Staten, yeah, uh, Thomas, um, Candace Staten. I was really good friends with her sister and I was just amazed at all of the work that Candace was doing. And um, Helen Sanders, uh, I didn't know that well, but at that time, Helen was real active in the Durham community. So, um, Sauda reminded me that Gladys Marie Fry was uh, uh, at the Humanities Center. She was a fellow there and did an exhibit. Bertie had talked to Gladys, uh, Dr. Fry, about her interest in starting a quilt group and Dr. Fry uh, encouraged her to do that. Well, she had been talking about it for years, and she came by my office. I was working downtown on Main Street, and she had this dead woman's quilt scraps and blocks. <laughs> and I was like, Bertie, stop. <laughs> and I said, let's set the date. That was February, I remember it. And that was February, and we said, March, we're going to like meet, and uh, we're going to stop this. And the thing that stood out, we wanted to make sure we had it in a, a place of historical significance to African Americans. And so we chose the Stanford Warren Library. And um, we decided we would just put the word out, tell everybody we knew, and we asked people to come 
prepared to introduce themselves through a quilt and to bring a quilt or a quilt project that they were working on at the time. And that's how it started. And at the end of the meeting, the question was, do y'all want to continue this? And everybody said, yeah. And we said, where? And we said, we'll check with Haytai. The executive director at that time, who was Diane Pledger, I think she recognized the value of having us as a, a, an art group, you know, here kind of based at Haytai. And uh, she always um, understood the importance of promoting and preserving culture. So I think it was just one of those relationships that kind of grew and thank God it did because we still have a great relationship with Hey Tai. Um, and then we also um, started doing exhibits, like right out the gate. I mean, we had that first meeting and before you knew it, nine months later we had our first exhibit right here. And uh, the first exhibit was called uh, Lest We Forget Preserving Our African American uh, Quilting Heritage. And we had a ton of people uh, that showed up. Now, this is a young group. And our communities, the members knew people, and we knew people, and it just all kind of came together. And we have consistently had exhibits uh, every 18 months since then. It seems that African American Quilt Circle of Durham has a really robust relationship with Durham, even though people come from Virginia and other parts of North Carolina. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how being in Durham has impacted, if you think being in Durham has impacted your quilting, either from the stories you tell or what you use, and then maybe we can talk a little bit about the guild's relationship to the community. I was the only black child in all of my classes because of the area where I lived. In college, class of 300 had three black graduates. So my association with my own people was limited to church on Sunday. Now imagine I moved to Durham in 1992. It was like I had almost landed in heaven because finally there were so many people that I could relate to personally and in so many, you know, different, other, uh, different ways. But when this quilt group started, I went. And I was never so welcomed. I felt free to do things that weren't printed in the book, didn't tell you how to do it. If your points didn't match, you weren't put out. You know, all of, you know, all of those kinds of things that had been put into my head uh, when I arrived just evaporated. And all I can say to that is, thank God, it evaporated. I found a joy in this group, I found an exuberance, and I, you know, I could still practice those, you know, techniques that I had learned, mm -hmm. but I could express everything in a new way. Um, AAQC has a marvelous community involvement, more so than a lot of you realize. People don't know how active we are. And we've been active in the community since our inception 20 years ago. And we're always involved in community projects. Um, the position that I applied for was donation quilts, OK? Well, we make donation quilts. Now, lest I forget, you know, as you get old, you got to refer to your notes so you don't leave anybody out. We made donation quilts for the preemies, the premature babies at UNC Chapel Hill. We made them for high school graduates at the Oxford Manor Achievement School in Durham. We made, as an incentive to a lot of the students who were living in public housing who dropped out, 
when you graduate, you get a quilt. And we provided that for them. We made quilts for um, the John Hope Franklin Scholars Program at, at Duke University. We made them for several years for the African Children's Choir that came over every year to raise money for uh, different projects in their homeland. Even the Burning Coal Theater, okay? But the one place where we continuously give quilts is to the homeless people. Those people who are residents, it was Genesis home that houses families, not individuals, but families with children. And we still do that uh, today. And one of the things that really inspired me, I, I served on the board at Genesis Home for people to arrive with the clothes on their back and children in their arms, living in cars, etc. Many, many of us have made small quilts for babies. And one of the things that they do once these families are placed in a home, they are given a quilt for their new home. I have met some of the recipients, and you'll never know how important that is. First of all, it tells them that somebody really cares about me, that they would do this. Now, the other things that we do in the community, in not just helping families moving forward, but we've had community quilt days where the community members come in, they bring their quilts, they tell their stories about the quilts, they share with one another, and we participated at the Museum of History in Raleigh for, I guess, about 15 years. Immaculata Catholic School has us come over. Just two weeks ago, we did one, uh, an, um, quilt project with children at W.G. Pearson. We're actively involved in the young, with the young. But we also go to senior citizens. And we have, uh, we've been invited to programs, you know, there to talk about quilts, to show the quilts, and, and that type of thing. And it's very refreshing for the, um, for the older people. We are really uh, a group that is well known throughout the state for, as the kind of go-to group for mm -hmm. quilting, African-American quilting, which is really an honor for us because it's not like we had a mission to go out and to build this kind of reputation in the community. It kind of happened organically. You know, people would come, they would seek us out versus us seeking out activities to do in the community. And I think that is a testament to our mission in the very beginning and the reputation that we built over time, uh, one year uh, after the next. So in an another big achievement that we received because of our uh, community uh, commitment to the community was uh, in 2010, I believe, we received the Indies Award and that's an award that's given every year to an, organiz an arts organization or group that has done extraordinary contributions in cultural life in the triangle. And this was a big honor for us. Um, so I was telling the group, um, the, one of the guilds in Detroit had a really big exhibit uh, for Black History Month. And as you know, Detroit has been suffering under so many different types of structural uh, racism and economic inequality. But one of the quilters in that group said that she thought that there was a really unique relationship between quilting and African American life. And I was wondering how you guys felt about that. You kind of touched on it a little bit out in your last set of comments. But um, if you wanted to talk about that. If you had a stack of quilts you had a sense of security, at least in Southwest Georgia, where it wasn't like cold, like New England cold, but it was cold, uh, freezing. And so quilts 
represented like, you know, as a child for us, it was like having wood or paying, you know, the electric bill. You could, you were secure. You had a quilt, you had a freezer with some food in it, and you were pretty much set. You know, there was, and that was important that you had that kind of security. Um, so I think that um, quilts have always responded to a particular environment. Uh, and I think like the quilts that you see among the African-American uh, quilt circle, you will see that they are, they are responding to today's environment. Like the story quilts, the narrative quilts. I mean, you know, a child is killed, black lives matter. Um, issues around um, well, we're gonna talk some about the most recent exhibit, Threads Connecting Lives. But I would say that that tradition of having quilts to express um, stories, to express love. I mean, even if you go back to days of enslavement, even though people may not have been doing narrative quilts per se, um, they were taking pieces of scraps or fabric that were significant to them um, and including those in the quilts. Um, and every quilt tells a story, regardless of whether it's intentional or unintentional, there is a story there. So um, I, I think that that's, um, that's one of the aspects of how African-American quilts are unique or quilts are unique in the African-American experience. One other thing I would say, um, during the periods of enslavement, African-American women oftentimes were instructed to do quilting by their mistresses or you know, the woman in the big house and um, they were expected to do them in a certain kind of way. But the quilts that were in the quarters that the women had less time were altogether different. They could have been made with uh, burlap sack bags or feed bags, or they could have been, the batting may not have been cotton batting, but it would have been straw or an old quilt I remember we had lots of quilts that were made with old quilts as the batting. Um, and I think from that experience, African-American women, there was something, um, you know, there was, that was part of the freedom thing, you know, because you knew that there were these expected, you know, there were these patterns, but you had fewer resources, less time, and you had to make it work. You know, because you had folk to keep warm, too. So I think some of those threads continue today in how we approach quilting. You know, that risk-taking, um, that, you know, I, I, I think that's enough said. But I could talk all day about <laughs> quilting um, before the guilds became very active and about promoting it as an art and as a history, um, suffered from the kind of invisible, invisibilization of black labor in general. And so if you looked in museums, and my mother is, I, I have to kind of give a shout out to my mom because she is like, I want to tear about this. If you go to museums, they will often attribute quilts to the mistress of the household or the owner of the plantation. And, not, and it's only in the past like 10 to 20 years they've actually been kind of making clear to visitors that the quilts in fact were by the enslaved women or the sh women who were sharecropping, who were making for themselves and also for the household. And so that's, you know, so the tradition of African American quilting goes back to the first days of, of um, Africans being brought here. And so I think that's, that's a kind of beautiful service that the guilds provide, and particularly AAQC, and kind of making sure people understand this, this history is kind of an art and a, a labor of love that mm -hmm. continues through generations. And so people have their own archive 
if they have quilts from their family, you have an archive. And so I hope if you're here, if you're friends, you know, that you encourage them to take photos and, and name who made the quilts because it's only fairly recently that we've been encouraged to put labels on every quilt we make. And so mm -hmm. a lot of the quilts that are part of our family collections are not, you know, after a few generations, people forget. And so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna take this as a soapbox moment to say, please, please document your family quilts. I th th thank you. Uh, you know, th that raised an interesting question, and this may have been sort of an unspoken uh, principle in the organizing of the African American Quilt Circle, because we chose not to, like, attach Gill to our name. Mm -hmm. And part of what we understand the role of a Gill is to prepare folk to do stuff in a certain way. You know, it was um, really important at certain, in certain points of history for women, particularly to be able to demonstrate their sewing skills and their literacy skills, because they needed to get a husband. And the, you know, the father would say, see what my daughter can do? <laughs> we didn't go that route. Actually, and I wanted to add, I didn't share this with you guys, but I was at Tougaloo in the Tougaloo archives about two weeks ago, and I was looking through the course catalogs from the found, from, well, the earliest ones they have, which were in the 1870s, and quilting was part of the curriculum, which I was really surprised to see. So my other question, which you've all kind of, you know, already touched a little bit is about whether quilting expresses, how quilting expresses your politics and whether that expression of your politics have changed over time. The election of President Obama yes. brought about a really major change in quilting. Yeah. There, was, there was such excitement. And there was a, I guess there's, there were books put out. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a book, uh, Journey of Hope, that's mm -hmm. what it was called, Journey of Hope, where people all across the United States, quilters, submitted a quilt that talked about the importance of, of that particular event. Okay, and in, a, in addition to that, now it's, taken on still another aspect with women's rights. You know, feminism has been around, you know, like drive for a long time, but you know, usually black women were too busy trying to struggle to make it, to get, you know, to just go from day to day to day, let alone jump on a bandwagon. But now, I want you to know that we have a freedom of expression that is appreciated. Our work was not always appreciated. There are, uh, I have to mention this one person, you know who it's gonna be. Dr. Carolyn Maslumi has spent years promoting African American quilting in different aspects and she was one of the first to do a lot of these exhibits. And we talk about what is going to, you know, I guess happen down the road. Yeah. Who knows what's gonna happen, but <laughs> her next exhibit, and I think you have a quilt in that. I know I do. And it's called Envisioning Human Rights in the new millennium. We each selected a particular basic human right. I chose freedom of expression, and I think, Sauda, you chose leisure. Yes, you the said right. the right to leisure. Mm -hmm. But there are like 29 or 30 of them, and that is going to open up this summer, sometime in June. It's a little delayed, but again, it's and it, it is showing how we are moving ahead in society as a whole. We are free to express our opinions. Um, I have always um, used my quilts as a second voice 
to express things that were important to me. Um, and things that matter show up in my, in my quilts, like for example with Trayvon Martin. Um, this very first quilt, uh, it has fabric from one of my dear friends. Um, we were active in the civil rights uh, movement together, and he was in exile in Tanzania, and he sent me back fabric. And this piece here, I'm just looking at it, I'm like, I know it was in there, but it's sitting here like, here I am. This is one of the pieces that he sent back. So that is just an expression of uh, me just putting him and what his struggle was and his politics was in, in this quilt. You have to ask yourself, why do you make a quilt? And I don't propose to make a quilt to answer everybody or anybody's question. Uh, I would like to think that a quilt that has some political connotations or whether subversive or what not, whatever, to encourage you to think about it and to go do your own research and to explore more on your own. It's about sparking a conversation. It's not about you looking at it and you deriving all of the answers. It's not, that's not the purpose of why someone may make a quilt like that. And, and that's what I do. It doesn't matter at all if anybody says anything about that quilt or like it or dislike it. It's more about me expressing what is important to me in my heart and my feelings about a situation. And if, some, if I can attract someone's attention to that topic, that's, that's the gravy or the icing on the cake. I'll put it that way. <laughs> so I think it's really about constantly asking yourself, why do you quilt and why do you make a particular quilt? And once you're clear on that, it's up to the viewer to reach their own conclusions about it, whether it stops them after they leave that quilt or whether it encourages them to go and to learn and seek out more information. To give you an idea, at our last exhibit, Annette Bailey, who's teaching a class now in Norfolk at a black quilters oh, yes, right. get together, right, okay, she suggested that we uh, put up some, or make a quilt that is reflective of the pressures of today and what's happening today. You know, it's not limited to Black Lives Matter or gun violence or gang violence or black on black crime or human trafficking. But what has happened? We all did our quilts. We had them up there. Those quilts have gone to different locations and served as an impetus and to open discussions and conversations about racism and inequality. I think all black quilts are political and I think that because they are a testament to survival and they also, in the earliest quilts, they are meant to protect and keep comfortable families. And when we were brought here, we were not meant to survive. We were meant to labor and die. And we were not meant to have families. And so I do think that even quilts that are abstract quilts that somebody made for their family or an enslaved woman made for her child, that it is a political act because it's about asserting autonomy over yourself and over your family. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I learned when researching um, slave quilts, when the slaves made their quilts, they would actually sew inside the quilt an herb that they used in Africa. They would put in a piece of fabric and different little things like that were actually sewn into the quilt. And in addition, because they didn't have time to do all the stitching in and out so forth, they tied their quilts, and there was a particular knot that they used to tie the quilts, and that knot was to serve as protection for the person sleeping under the quilt. Uh, one of the things that we're faced with in this 21st century is 
how do we deal with ambiguity, not knowing what's going to happen? And particularly if we do things in a different way, if we approach our community work uh, in a more equitable way or our school work, you know, towards um, peace and equity. But we don't know what it's going to look like. And that's the same thing about quilting. I mean, we may have that vision, we may have that dream, but there's something about quilting that gives me the hope and strength to take a risk. I can cut that fabric apart. I don't know, well, I, I, I know, I have the vision. I have the vision, but I'm gonna work with it until it comes, um, you know, it comes into shape. So persistence, that's an important part when you're talking about community change and transformation. You've got to be persistent. You can't make a quilt unless you're persistent. You've got to do something on a quilt every day. Well, if you don't do anything every day, you'll be doing it for decades. <laughs> so I think as a metaphor, it is really important, and I'm always looking for those intersections. I mean, I, sometimes, like, I pray for them, you know, like folk pray for wisdom or pray to God. You know, I pray to the, you know, the quilt and the quilting to give me a direction, give me the strength. And, um, you know, it, it works. <laughs> I'm so glad you brought up Obama um, because it feels to me that that first election really visually showed connections between African Americans and various um, uh, textiles in the African continent. So um, in, in many countries, it's a practice when there is a, a, a big figure or big uh, social historical event to produce a piece of cloth that commemorates that event. And so you could see in South Africa and Kenya and Ghana, different pieces of Obama cloth with Obama's uh, you know, face and different things. And in he and here, you could see so many Obama quilts in, the, in, the, in 2008 and the years after. So it's a really, it's a very nice visual kind of connection. Oh, and, and um, I have to, I want to back up a little bit on the Obama piece because um, Roland Freeman, you yeah. all also yes. were invited to participate in um, uh, no, not the mule train, the Obama quilts that he did oh, at yes. the DC Museum. Yeah. Yeah. And that was before um, the um, Hope's vision of the, the Hope book. Well, I, I also, since we're giving shout outs, I also want to give a shout out to Cuesta Benberry, yes. who's a, a phenomenal historian, particularly of African American and American quilts. And she died, I think, in 2007 and gave her archive and her research notes to Michigan State University. So people mm -hmm. who in the future who want to study African American quilting can go through the kind of enormous kind of uh, set of notes that she's mm -hmm. uh, compiled over the years. And we were blessed to have Cuesta come to visit us. Um, and she came when we, at the time when we had an exhibit up. And it was just an honor to know that, you know, we were able to just be in that sacred quilting space with her. So uh, the Quilt Guild has, well, not Guild, excuse me, the Quilt Circle has been very um, uh, fortunate to have had a lot of the uh, quilt historians and the who's who in the quilting arena to come and visit us. And again, that community network extends beyond North Carolina. Um, just like they say Columbus discovered America, even though there were people living here. Uh, about 20 years ago, the quilters of G's Ben were discovered. There was an exhibit at the Corcoran Gallery in Washington, D.C., and the African American Quilt Circle went there to view that exhibit. It was like a religious experience. We saw it on a Sunday morning, too, and it was just, it was a very moving thing. But what I want to share with you is the fact that those quilts were made by people to survive. Now, they have the modern quilt movement.
They use simple designs, basic shapes, bright colors, solids, lots of neutrals and, and white spaces and open space, and they're improvisational. That's the modern quilt movement. Modern? We've been doing it for years. Black quilting has had an impact on quilting, period. I think all of the quilt movements have been inspired, stole, or whatever you want to call it, by what has come before them. And I think the modern quilt movement has done that. Uh, I think they have used the traditional blocks in a different, exciting way. But I think the, what I'm going to really uh, try to drill home is that the modern quilt movement is a moment in time, and it has brought the idea of quilting to another age group that is reimagining what traditional quilts, Amish quilts, G's Bend quilts, art quilts, improvisational quilts, all of that combined, they have been inspired by, the, by those other paths of quilting. And if you look at the, the, early, the oldest, the average age of a quilter today, according to these national quilt studies, is 62. Okay, now we can do the math. And if the average age is 62, what, what does that say about the future of quilting in general? So if this movement, modern or not, if this movement is reimagining quilting for another generation, that's a good thing. Because if not, the tradition of quilting is just going to eventually just die. So it has to be some energy that's put into the art form to bring new blood and new inspirations for new groups to pick up the banner. Well, I walk all the way from you, say, Louis Town. Oh, and I hear the one more lies it down. Back waters of the junk every hour. I hate to admit it. I can't quit, I gotta think.